Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the uh, panel discussions and the sessions we've had so far. Uh, this is the sixth uh, panel uh, as part of the Middle East Strategy Forum 2021. Uh, don't forget that you can go to our website, peacediplomacy.org, to see live discussions and view the previous ones uh, in case you missed any of the panels or if you want to share it with your network. Uh, during the day, most of our uh, discussions were focused on strategy, great power competition, defense and security. Now we want to switch gears a, a little bit and talk about humanitarian diplomacy in the region and the role that Canada can play in this important field. Uh, for this discussion, we have three distinguished panelists, Dr. Erika D. Ruggiero, uh, Catherine Gribben and Amir Barmaki. Unfortunately, uh, Rehane Patel from Islamic Relief Canada had to cancel her attendance because of an urgent work commitment. Uh, let me briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, this is only a summarized version of their bios. Uh, the list of their accomplishments and experiences is much longer than uh, what we have time to, uh, to review uh, in this panel and in this introduction. Uh, Dr. Erika Di Ruggiero is the Director of Center for Global Health and Associate Professor at the University of Toronto's Dalla Lana School of Public uh, Health. Uh, Dr. Di Ruggiero's program of research examines how evidence affects global policy agendas related to employment, other determinants and health equity in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. Her work addresses governance related questions about the roles of public private partnerships and global institutions in the promotion of health, health equity, and the prevention of non-communicable disease and related risk factors. Catherine Gribben is the Senior Legal Advisor on International Humanitarian Law at the Canadian Red Cross. Catherine recently returned from Nigeria, where she was the Operational Legal Coordinator for the IRC's Nigeria delegation. She has worked at the Canadian Red Cross in a number of different positions since 2006. Amir Barmaki is a deputy representative and government liaison manager for Sikoa office in Tehran, where he is tasked with Iranian German vocational qualification project for Afghan refugees in Iran. Prior to joining Sikoa, uh, he served as the head of the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Iran. Amir has more than 20 years of experience in humanitarian and development fields, working in different capacities with UN agencies and with local and international NGOs since 1998. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us today and providing us with your time. Uh, first, I wanna ask each of our panelists to provide their opening statements about the importance of humanitarian diplomacy in the Middle East and Canada's role in this field. And I want them to possibly address this question of how, in their opinion, would investment in humanitarian diplomacy as a foreign policy tool can serve Canada's interests in the region. Uh, we're going to start with Erika, and then we'll go to Catherine, and then Amir after. Erika, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak among this distinguished panel uh, and for this invitation. And um, this big question that you've asked e each of us, I think we'll Speaking from my own personal view, we'll only be able to scratch the surface on what is a very, very big topic, but let me try to attempt to do that. I mean, I think um, just to situate my comments within the context of my own background, which is in global public health, we know that global health issues are complex and they know no boundaries. And of course, COVID-19 has really taught us that um, the pandemic has a global reach, but that it also disproportionately impacts already marginalized communities, regions, and countries. And it's also highlighted the fragility of our health and social and economic systems, which really calls for greater collaboration across borders. So from a health perspective, um, I think it's fair to say that health isn't always central to any foreign policy strategy, and um, it certainly has been previously employed as a political instrument to promote peace, security, and prosperity. 
So of course it holds potential, which brings me to situating your question about humanitarian diplomacy as part of a broader field of global health diplomacy, which I think it's important to sort of link the two, and I hope we'll have a chance to kind of talk about that intersection. But global health diplomacy, of which humanitarian diplomacy is, is a piece of, is really a process of multi-actor engagement that really seeks to shape global policy context, influencing, in this case, health or positioning health or humanitarianism in foreign policy negotiations. Of course, it has many facets, um, but it also requires strong institutions that need to work across country interests um, and negotiate effectively. And now more than ever, we need to really be taking these uh, opportunities for greater collaboration and in the spirit of greater solidarity. But this has to, of course, be uh, reinforced um, through the kinds of negotiations and um, peace building efforts that global health diplomacy can bring to the table. And I would argue that this can extend to our humanitarian efforts framed within a global health diplomacy approach that centers equity. And I mean, I say this because I, I do know that scholars have called out the significant tension that is embedded in humanitarian diplomacy. Unlike diplomacy, humanitarianism actually does focus ideally on helping people in need and tries to maintain neutrality, um, whereas diplomacy actually involves compromise and consensus. And so that means that equity or those who are really most in need, which of course is in the eye of the beholder, those issues are not always explicitly con uh, considered. And so I think there's this inherent tension there. And that's, of course, true for any government, including the Canadian government. And so I think we have to take a hard look at how humanitarian aid and uh, what the various actors and intentions involved in all of that is used as an instrument of diplomacy and how it overall intersects with development aid and uh, that is provided by different countries. And finally, I would say that humanitarian efforts are also challenged by regional competition, by longstanding and new donors. And I think this is um, particularly true in regions like the Middle East, but not exclusively. And so there are issues of capacity of international humanitarian orga uh, organizations. And these are challenged in their ability to stay true to their humanitarian principles. And so these tensions between sort of um, development, uh, humanitarianism and and sort of the central point of your question around humanitarian diplomacy are are things that I think we have to contend with. So I wanted to start off with a few comments like that, uh, food for thought for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Catherine, go ahead. Well, uh, I wanted to reiterate thanks and also express my excitement of being able to follow Erica because my comments really build on the groundwork that she has just laid by, and, and what I would kind of set the scene for my interventions is by proposing that this integration of foreign policy uh, objectives into humanitarian diplomacy is actually a serious threat. Uh, that erodes principled humanitarian action, uh, especially during times of armed conflict, and that's the, the area that I can speak to in particular. So um, what I would propose is that humanitarian diplomacy should actually be the tool by which we protect that humanitarian space that Erica had mentioned, talking about those principles of impartiality, uh, humanitarian, um, efforts that are actually directed towards those who are most in need, and that it actually shouldn't be a tool to advance um, uh, foreign policy objectives, which, as Eric had said, are inherently political in nature. And this is really where we get those tensions, again, that Erica had mentioned. So what I would like to remind us all of is that the majority of states actually have committed to, to support, to facilitate the implementation of principled humanitarian action. They've done so by signing on to the Geneva Conventions, um, as well as other good faith initiatives, for example, good humanitarian donorship initiative. Um, and what we've seen is that as the humanitarian foreign policy landscape has become more complex, actually humanitarian diplomacy remains as a tool by which all of us um, can use that as a key tool to remind governments that the politicization of aid actually puts that humanitarian effort and aid and action into jeopardy. Um, and so 
again, to kind of go back to our fundamentals, what we have to concern ourselves with, especially looking at times of armed conflict, is that this space of humanitarian action is actually codified, uh, it's protected under the rules of armed conflict, also referred to as international humanitarian law. We all know that IHL applies exactly during times of armed conflict. And IHL explicitly states that impartial humanitarian assistance must get to the civilians in need. So exactly as Erica had said, that humanitarian attention is meant to be going to and getting to those most in need. And that's the legal framework that surrounds what we're talking about actually reiterates that. Um, the protection of civilians, them having access to humanitarian assistance, as well as humanitarian assistance actually being able to get to them, so to those civilian populations in need. I mean, this is a fundamental tenant of international humanitarian law. It's a long-standing commitment of the parties to uh, the Geneva Conventions and recognized as customary international law. But as we've heard, especially over the, the day and for those of us who work in this field, um, and as Eric had mentioned too, we have these tensions, right? And so we've seen that there has been an integration or a tendency to take the humanitarian agenda and kind of conflate it or include it within these aspects of foreign policy, such as the military and political efforts that have been mentioned by previous panels. And then, uh, and this actually kind of raises two key issues for us to think about. One, that this has actually led to efforts whereby humanitarian principles um, have been actually eroded and they've been compromised in order to achieve other foreign policy objectives. And then the other is instances where, you know, neutral and partial humanitarian assistance actually has made it to the, made it to the communities in need. And the communities in need are highly suspect that this assistance doesn't actually come with the political or military strings attached because of their previous experiences, right? So we have this, this threat that the perception or erosion um, of what humanitarian assistance should be has actually been eroded by the communities who are, who are most in need and should be able to receive it. So um, I just wanted to kind of say that um, we should be thinking about the fact that there should be this separation. Um, we should be focusing on the whole notion that the impartiality, the humanity, this protected legal space is what drives that humanitarian decision making and not other factors such as those military um, political efforts. And we should be looking at what the rules of armed conflict allow for, speaking to the parties of the conflict and ensuring that they, those individuals with power and control have that understanding um, of what that protected humanitarian space is. So we're able to focus and make sure it gets to those who are most in need. So again, thanks very much to Erica for fab opening remarks. And uh, Bijan, back to you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Amir, please go ahead. Thanks again for inviting me for a very interesting actually topic. I just want to remind just one matter. Actually, I'm not representing any organization here. I'm in my own personal capacity here, not the CEQA or uh, UN or OCHA or any of it. It's very interesting actually discussions and matter has been raised by the colleagues and I'm uh, it reminds me of uh, a year and a half ago that we have a number of actually more uh, serious issues in the region before Corona and now COVID is taking over <laughs> everything else seems to be that's the only humanitarian problem you're facing is not the case actually and I want to actually emphasize that you have still a lot of humanitarian crises in the region that COVID-19 compared to some of it is not really that important in this region just look what's happening in Gaza and Israel now and the number of this and the destruction and all of that the issue is that uh, a really interesting remark was made by the two comments, uh, two colleagues, but now I want to actually look at a bit more from overall perspective of actually the Canadian government and Canadian foreign policy and also UN role here and the ICRC and actually in NGOs and, and the governments here. What we, what I could see actually from, from a distance at, as a person who was ex-OCHA in Iran, and uh, dealing with humanitarian issues and also an ex-Canadian, basically, I was a resident of Canada for many years, is that the, the there is a different, we know, uh, just for a reminder actually to the colleagues actually who are, and the people who are watching actually this program, there's a difference of view between the UN and ICRC on these issues. I mean, I'm catching those very well, specifically that 
UN tries a bit to engage more governments into the human actually humanitarian space in order to get actually funding and actually use them for pushing parties to the conflict to come actually to a, to a you know resolution or a, a peace deal that may not be appreciated all the time by all the humanitarian actually actors they always have that conflict in the field that the UN tries to be a bit more political actually organization on, on the ground and between the humanitarian actually work uh, agencies uh, and agencies like ICRC try to really keep themselves away from this actually political uh, you know fear of of uh, humanitarian diplomacy actually and it's very really right that should be the way it is actually but for, for Canada, I mean, if you look at the situation of the Middle East and actually the, the, the number of humanitarian crises that we have and emergencies and disasters on top of it now COVID, which is a temporary matter that will go away, but disasters will stay, emergencies will stay for different reasons actually in the region and the wars that we have in the region, is that compared to the size of Canada and actually the number of immigrants and actually citizens who have from this region specifically, like specifically for countries like Iran, actually, and Pakistan, and uh, although we could say Pakistan is not part of Middle East, but it is uh, somehow, and uh, Iraq and Syria in, in Lebanon, actually, in Canada. Although Canada may not see itself as a, as a major player in the Middle East politics and humanitarian, actually, diplomacy and all, everything else related around of it, but because of this huge diaspora that we have in Canada from this region, automatically whatever happens in this region drags Canada in because of protection of actually the, the people who are in, living in this part of the world with a Canadian passport or the, or the family members of a Canadian citizen who lives now in Canada. And also for peace, international peace purposes, for humanitarian actually purposes, for human rights issues, which Canada says I really respect it and I want to implement that in, in all over the world. But we don't see that really uh, we don't see that role of Canada that much in the Middle East. It's simply how, how Canada is very much a follower of a number of other Western countries, mainly USA and UK in the region. Very much I could compare Canada with Australia's role actually in the Middle East, basically. They try to be engaged, but not very engaged. They try to hide themselves a bit behind the bigger powers, basically, in the, in the region. But the bigger powers in the region have completely different mandate compared to Canada. Russians and Chinese are completely different in this region than Canada. Canada has a, we, we, we believe that they have a moral and uh, obligation beyond actually Canada has been proved to be a country who cares about human rights and humanitarian actually principles a bit more than put it that way, other countries in the region. This is the perception of the Middle East uh, people in the Middle East. So that's one issue with Canada. There is a certainly a lack of active foreign Canadian policy with regard to Middle East, especially when it comes to humanitarian issues. I could give an example, the closure of the embassy of Canada in Iran. Why? I mean, there are big questions about it. And you have such a large community of Iranian Canadians, how you could not have an embassy in this country? Just look up what happened one year and a half ago, the, the shutting down of the Ukrainian airline with 176 Canadians on, on, on that plane, no consular, relations, no diplomatic relations, how can they really gonna defend and protect the rights of these people who were on that plane when it doesn't have even a presence in the country that this incident happened. And also the presence of the refugees. And I want to actually go back to the matter of refugees that Canada, because it doesn't have that much of relations with a number of countries in the region, politically I'm saying, Yemen, Syria and Iran again, I could not really use uh, its resources and its ability to talk with these governments who are having this number of refugees, either they're creating refugees or they're hosting refugees at the same time. And to be able actually to use its um, basically uh, power and capacity in order to uh, have some kind of dialogue with these countries in the region on the matter of refugees. Afghanistan is another actually major problem. I mean, with the return of Taliban, we could all see that the return of Taliban would be soon. The Americans are pulling out, Canadians are pulling out, everyone is pulling out. Seems to be that we are back to normal. Nothing happened, sorry, after 20 years, we're getting out. What's gonna be the fate of these people actually? We're gonna have another influx and flu of the refugees, Afghan refugees into the region, to Europe, and then to Canada, to many other parts of the world. And we're gonna have another major civil war with Taliban inside Afghanistan soon. It's already there, 
it will actually uh, increase. So where is Canada? Where, where is standing on these issues? What's the policy of the government there? And then what is the situation of the humanitarian agencies from Canada who are operational in the Middle East with this situation, especially Afghanistan, I want to keep that in mind. So the Canada is somehow wants to be in the region. I'm talking about the specific region internationally also to have his own you know, uh, values, which is mainly humanitarian principles and human rights as, as they claim to be spread in the region, but it does not have really a policy or a strong, uh, you know, political will from Ottawa to really implement that or, uh, or uh, show it. And this is becoming a major problem, I think, for specifically for Canada. They might say, we are not a major international power player, so why we should be engaged that much? The problem is that, going back, and I will finish here, is the diaspora that Canada hosts that every time you have a crisis in this region, a few years ago was Lebanon, it would be another country soon, that thousands of Canadians still live in these countries and the Canadian government had to evacuate them or find a solution for them to protect them or uh, give them some immunities or talk to the governments of those countries where the conflict is happening in to protect this actually, this uh, dual nationals. And then Canada doesn't have the tools because it doesn't have the uh, the humanitarian uh, proper, I could say proper humanitarian aid policy in the, in the Middle East region compared to many other countries of the Europe, China, Russia, Japan, you know, Scandinavian countries and all of that. Uh, there's a lot of other matters to be discussed, but I will stop here actually. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask some follow-up questions. Um, about uh, the points that you mentioned in your uh, opening remarks. Um, Erika, let's talk about uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, I want to ask you, what has been the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the healthcare systems of uh, developing countries, especially in, uh, in the region, countries in, in the Middle East, in your opinion? And what role do you think Western countries like Canada can play in helping these countries strengthen their healthcare system now that we know we know that we're dealing with lots of problems here at home as well but in long term how can we what should we do in terms of uh, humanitarian support to strengthen the healthcare system of other developing countries for example in the middle east uh, to to be able to help them basically so that they can in future manage pandemics uh, better in compared to what has happened uh, this time with covid-19 pandemic yeah, and I mean, I, it's, um, I'm happy to answer that question, but I also just want to echo some of the comments I heard. And thanks, Catherine. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we were in sync since uh, this was the first time we met, but um, really would be happy to go back to some of those tensions. And also, Amir, your comment about Canada's um, sort of position, you know, it tends to call itself a middle power. And so I think that tends to affect its timidity in some cases. It follows, it doesn't always lead when it comes to certain policies. And then finally, you know, on the foreign policy front, the, um, to my knowledge, our foreign policy hasn't really been updated in over 20 years. I mean, this is what I've read most recently. And so I think the coherence that is needed around a foreign policy agenda for a country like ours um, can actually be challenged. And so when it comes to knowing what areas to prioritize, um, I think this, um, you know, it does affect a country's position and ability to act. Um, it's one of many things, which, you know, is sort of, I think I wanted to just pick up on a few of those threads that had been mentioned by my uh, the previous uh, speakers to sort of come back to your comment um, and now we're in this pandemic that is, you know, um, affecting everyone. And, you know, if you look at the current instruments like the government's, um, you know, commitment to improve the effectiveness of its international assistance by providing a more, and I'm gonna quote, integrated and responsive support, investing in more innovation and research, becoming more transparent about results and activities. You know, on paper, I think that sounds great. Um, but how is that actually deployed? And as um, Catherine really nicely put, the provision of development aid is not value neutral. It is increasingly politicized. 
and it can be used by donors to address country self-interest um, in a region. And I think we'd be kidding ourselves to not say that any country has, all countries have self-interest regardless. Um, and hopefully that is balanced, of course, with altruistic goals. Um, and the reason I give that backdrop is that I think there have been many calls to reimagine under what terms international assistance is actually allocated and to what end. And back to your question, this means helping others to help themselves by building local health system capacity that is sensitive to the geopolitical realities in the region, rather than creating this unnecessary dependency on external aid, which you know has, I think, been a focus of a lot of you know aid. This push about you know decoupling the strings, right, that come with aid. But I think the reality is that's still kind of happening, perhaps under different um, uh, guises. And, you know, one of the issues that, of course, has come up in the context of um, this uh, uh, current pandemic is vaccine production capacity. And while that's only one of the solution, I would argue that um, we need stronger and more equitable global mechanisms for vaccine access rather than sort of defaulting to production capacity by country. And this is where Canada has and continues to try to be an advocate because we find ourselves in the same boat, actually. Um, with respect to health systems, you know, I think without resilient health systems, countries, including those in the Middle East, cannot effectively combat current and future outbreaks. But as others have said, this outbreak, and I think, Amir, you made this point that um, COVID-19 is one of many issues that is just piling on top of so many other um, issues in the region. And, you know, while it may seem like a dramatic event for many countries, and it is not to under, um, underestimate its impact, you know, in some parts of the, um, uh, the world, including the region we're speaking of, it's a cumulative effect. So it's a piling on, it's crises on top crises. Um, and, um, and so that context is particularly important when we're thinking about um, resilient health system. And I don't think any country has the answer or the perfect system, because as we've seen with this pandemic, all health systems have been really tested and challenged. Um, but, you know, if we aspire to resilient health systems, that really involves the capacity of health actors, of institutions, of the population to prepare for and respond to crises um, and maintain core functions when a crisis hits. But that also assumes that you have time to rebuild and build back between crises. And in regions um, like the Middle East, you know, there are multiple crises always going on. And so this is a particular challenge. And I think it requires um, co-creation, co-development, support, and lessons learned that are very much informed by the way in which um, the crisis is unfolding in the region and to reorganize the conditions that require stronger health systems, because when they are in place, they produce good health and social outcomes um, for all during a crisis and um, in aftermath and um, in, in the aftermath. But, you know, based on some of the cross-country analyses that I'm aware of of health systems, I think we have to also look at what are some of those preconditions to resilience. Um, so one of them is really the global nature um, of several health crises and the clear indication of who does what, when, and, and what kind of supports are needed from external donors. And then what can countries do that are responsible for their own health systems in times of crisis? Um, they need external resources because the shocks to their health system reverberate in the region, right? So there's the within country effects, but then there are the regional effects. So it really requires a bit of a long-term view. Um, and I think it requires us to think about health systems as a global public good that requires a collective response from the global community. And if this is, I think, the, what we're aiming for, um, then back to my earlier comments around international assistance, then that insistent needs to be then provided with humanitarian goals in mind. Um, and um, to really begin to rebuild and also address the root causes of limited capacity. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Erica. Um, Amir, uh, you previously served as the head of UN OCHA in Iran 
and now you're working with another NGO and lead their projects uh, supporting refugees in Iran. Uh, sanctions hit Iran is currently experiencing its fourth wave of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, I want to ask you about the impact of sanctions. Uh, Iran is not the only country in the region that's dealing with the pandemic under economic sanctions. Uh, tell us uh, about the impact of sanctions on the ability of Iran uh, to, to manage uh, the pandemic. Um, has there been, and, and during this time, uh, over a year, Iran now is, uh, has been dealing with this, and it was one of the first countries that was hit by the pandemic uh, after, after China. Has there been outside humanitarian aid to address the impact of sanctions? Thanks for the question. It's quite the politically charged question now in this time. I mean, COVID Um, I mean, I corona becomes so much political, like corona itself. But yes, yeah, thanks. Partially, yeah. yeah. Hello. Can you um, we lost you. Yeah, for, you I hope yeah, we lost you for a couple of seconds. So if you don't mind uh, starting uh, over again after you were saying that it's a, a politically charged, it's a political question. But go ahead. I think. Uh, we lost Amir, but I'm sure uh, he's going to uh, come back and join us. He's joining us from Iran, so there might be, I know that they have to use a VPN uh, to join uh, Zoom. So let's hope that we can have him back soon. Uh, but Catherine, I want to actually ask you to comment on this question uh, from, a, from a legal perspective. Uh, what are the uh, restriction? Uh, Am I back? I mean, you're me back actually. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry, Tehran on internet. And I'm using, you know, interesting for the watchers, yeah. Zoom is sanctioned in Iran. So, the, by US government, you could not have application of Zoom in Iran unless you use a VPN channel. And then disruptions happen. Sorry about it. Communications. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a relevant ex example as well of yeah, the impact yeah. of sanctions. Communication. Uh, go ahead. You were. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You were. You were talking about. I'm the sorry. Maybe someone else was speaking that I don't want to disrupt. If any of the colleagues were actually commenting, but uh, if if I'm allowed, actually quickly, I will say before another disruption by the Zoom. <laughs> it's the the issue is that yes, the sanctions have hit Iran very hard. Also Yemen and Syria uh, on, on different issues, and also uh, Iraq partially, but more on Iran. The there's a, a few fold issues. When you have the whole problem of the politics in the Middle East mixed up with health, unfortunately, and the health of the people, you face up situations like this. That Iranian government has banned a number of specific vaccines to be imported into Iran, including Pfizer, for political reasons. Then on top of it, you have the sanctions that you could not actually have international transfer of money to the banks to pay for the other kind of vaccines that we could buy from other actually uh, producers. Then on top of all of that, WHO is trying to use COVAX, also part of the COVAX actually share for Iran, but then somebody had to pay for it. And then we, Iranian government is, doesn't have access to, is blocked, uh, you know, reserves, out, hard currency reserves in other countries. So they need to get engage United States into this matter for United States to give special waivers to a certain countries to release some money to go and buy vaccines, including South Korea, as an example, I'm saying. The, it's getting so complex now, it works, but it's much slower and much, much less effective actually and productive in a pro that you need to deal actually in the case of a humanitarian and emergency or a health crisis. It really uh, disrupts the process of actually uh, health uh, management and, and actually emergency in this situation. So on top of, unfortunately, the other previous political problems that, that they, we have here, it was in Iran. Then additionally on Corona, unfortunately sanctions is also having, having a very serious effect on, on access to, to vaccine. It comes so uh, problematic. This is something for colleagues to know also is interesting that Iranian government is now asking for international community to provide vaccines for Afghan refugees living in Iran separately. So government is only buying now vaccine only for Iranian nationals. But when you have 1 million registered Afghans in the country and 2 million non-registered Afghans in the country, the Iranian government is saying that I'm sanctioned, you don't act, give me access to buy a vaccine for my own people. Then you as international community had to buy vaccine for the Afghan refugees living in Iran. 
it, you know, it, it creates certain humanitarian human rights issues. Absolutely. And then US is out of this equilibrium, but Canada could be a big support here, could be a mediator here, could talk to different parties, could provide some aid. But I think somebody needs to talk to also governments like Iran when you differentiate between the people who are living in the country to receive vaccine. The virus could not understand who's local, who's not local. <laughs> virus goes to everyone. So, uh, and, but this is becoming actually a humanitarian crisis on top of other crises. It's who will buy vaccine and provide vaccine for Afghan refugees inside Iran? I'm talking about 1 million people and the, the most vulnerable. So uh, I think Catherine was speaking and actually Erika, both of them. But the issue of uh, vulnerability of actually the different groups in the society in getting actually health support and equity. Equity has been violated completely here because of or partially sanctions, partially. But then in response to sanctions, a government may decide some specific decisions for political reasons in order to a tit for tat kind of situation against the sanctions by a certain state. And who's gonna suffer? A poor refugee who lives in Iran or a different country for this matter. Yes, so unfortunately sanctions is impacting beyond normal uh, effects that normally a sanction could have on a country. Thanks, Amir. Uh, Catherine, would you like to comment on this, especially from a, a legal perspective? And do you think there are legal gaps in the United States or, or Canadian laws uh, that must be addressed uh, with respect to the humanitarian impact of sanctions and how that affects the ability of different NGOs and international organizations in delivering aid? Sure, and instead of calling it a legal gap, uh, oftentimes in the humanitarian community, you're going to hear it referred to as the chilling effect. So uh, whereby you have a strong sanctions regime um, coming from either a domestic legal framework or from the UN, um, or it's from another country and impacts on, on another country. And it's whereby you have companies, uh, you have governments, you have different actors who are involved in the supply chain, as Amir has just pointed out, Let's use, let's use the supply chain of humanitarian goods, as both Erica and Amir have mentioned. And if you have companies who have done an analysis of what the various sanctioned regimes have an impact on their work, um, even if it legally uh, they wouldn't be in violation of the law, what we have seen within the humanitarian community uh, is a chilling effect that because the risk uh, of being perceived to be in violation of the sanctions would impact business, it would impact, uh, have, have large knock-on effects for all of their work, then you have many aspects within the industry that are stepping back from engaging in this. And this is really impacting um, the assistance and humanitarian assistance that's making its way to the civilian population. Uh, it's impacting that access to healthcare, equitable and otherwise, as Erica and Amir have also just very uh, correctly uh, cited. And so when you look at legal gaps, what we also want to be focusing on is, and we've had some successes of this, uh, references within previous UN Security Council resolutions that have said, uh, and, and in Canadian law, there's also specific exemptions that say, uh, we, and we refer, to, we refer to that as the humanitarian exemptions. Uh, and I feel that often not enough people know about this, that, that in fact, there have been intentions, um, not, not across all sanctions regimes, but this is an ask that we have to many governments and those who are involved in the sanctions regimes to ensure that there is in fact uh, a reiteration of these humanitarian exemptions. And why is there an exemption? Exactly because IHL says, no, uh, the civilian population has to receive this impartial humanitarian, it explicitly says in the Geneva Conventions, medical goods. Uh, and so this is, a, this is an example of where um, that type of provision of assistance uh, is in compliance with international humanitarian law. And we've had recognition, for example, UN Security Council that says, if given in compliance with IHL, then we're not actually in violation of 
you know, these counterterrorism efforts, including the sanctions regimes. So if anything, I'd say, Bijan, um, we have really important information that needs to get out to the entire community who's involved in the provision of services to communities uh, who are in need. Um, and reiterating what Erica had said about equitable access and equitable distribution, because we know it's not just access, but then distribution, uh, and making sure that there's an understanding that there is this humanitarian space, and that governments and humanitarian actors, uh, parties to the conflict, are committed to ensuring that humanitarian space exists, and that in actual fact, um, we want to advocate for this legal framework, um, for clarity on the legal framework, so that way we don't have this chilling effect on um, that then has this knock on effect on the civilian population uh, who have no control, right? Who, who don't, you don't get to come out and, and advocate, although, um, although they most certainly can. Um, so just saying that we need to parse that out, that's really important legal policy uh, information that needs to get out to the various industries who are all participating in this global, global effort of ensuring, and not just medical, but all goods by, that are essential to the civilian population survival, especially again, where I'm focusing, or I can reiterate the situations of armed conflict, that these are actually legal obligations that, that pre-exist and say, this is actually pre-existing. This, this is what people are entitled to in the first place. And effort should be should be given towards that. And Bijan, if I can, you had said like what what efforts could Canada make? Canada is a, a staunch supporter of international humanitarian law. They've made efforts um, in order to encourage others to comply with IHL. Um, they uh, were led the way of the G7 communique on IHL and compliance. And so you have recognition within those efforts of saying, here is where international humanitarian law um, applies. Here are efforts that can be made. Um, and in those particular efforts in the humanitarian space, this is a possibility um, for countries who are in support of international humanitarian law to be able to argue and point out um, this very important uh, principled humanitarian space. Thanks, Catherine. So, um, Erica, if you would like to comment on uh, this, especially um, you know the, the impact of sanctions. Uh, we, we discussed its impact right now on the, for example, the COVID situation, but there is a broader health impact as well, access, uh, people's access to uh, medicine, healthcare. We, uh, we know that some experts believe that it is severely impacted by sanctions as well. Uh, so if you would like to comment on this, please go ahead. But I want to uh, add sort of a question and, and, and go back to the issue of uh, sort of the vaccination and vaccine diplomacy. So. In the United States, Canada, with the increased rate of vaccination, hopefully step by step, we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, but but other developing countries, especially in the Middle East, uh, they are still dealing with the uh, pandemic and do not have access to enough vaccines for their population. So how do you think Canada and its international partners can help? What should be the priority? Is it the intellectual property waiver that a lot of people are talking about right now? Is it more uh, vaccine deployment through COVAX? What should be the priority for Canada at this stage with regards to uh, the vaccination? Yeah, well, well, first of all, thanks also to Catherine. That was really helpful um, context. So yeah, I'm not going to comment on sanctions. It's not my department, <laughs> but I've just learned a lot from the other colleagues about uh, obviously the implications of them. Um, maybe I'll just answer your question in a couple of ways. I would say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> to summarize what you just said, I think this is a very complex issue, um, as Catherine picked up. Also, you know, we're not just talking about, I mean, we're no longer producing a vaccine. This is not about that. It's about access, access for whom, how do we prioritize groups? I mean, all countries have struggled with this. But from a global perspective, the TRIPS waiver is one instrument, um, but there's been backlash from the CEOs of Big Pharma in not necessarily being too keen on that. I don't know where that stands right now, but I've certainly read that. 
Um, and so some countries may shy away from accepting um, or adopting or supporting that waiver because they fear their supplies, you know? This is a game, right? At the end, so you never know, right? And so there's part of that. It's not a reason to do it. I'm just saying it may fall into the calculus about why a country may or may not support uh, the TRIPS waiver. But I would actually like to sort of reframe the question more in terms of sort of what has been developing, and that is vaccine nationalism, right? And so COVAX was created. It was created with what I would consider to be very um, modest goals um, in terms of, you know, ensuring a certain percentage of um, vaccines to go to the, you know, most countries that A, don't have the capacity or the ability to access the vaccine, but it's still a pretty low target. Um, yet we've seen countries in Canada did do this a few months ago, pulling out some of their supplies because this is where the rub occurs between domestic and international, being a good international citizen and also meeting the needs of your own citizens. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging you know, dilemma or place to be in as a, as a country and all countries are like that, right? As we start to vaccinate more and more people, I think the question is, can we really then keep working on getting everybody vaccinated? You know, the latest, we've dropped the age already here to 18 and over now. We're now going down even lower because vaccines, um, you know, we're hearing about the evidence that the vaccines are safer for younger children. And yet, you know, many people in low and middle income countries still don't have a vaccine. So, you know, I would argue we need to focus on that. And we have to really ramp up the capacity in low and middle income countries. And that means the supply also has to be redirected towards those countries so that they can also um, vaccinate their own people, let alone even their healthcare workers um, who are contending with this um, pandemic um, as well. And COVAX was supposed to be addressing healthcare workers in part as well, right? That was part of the, the commitment. So, you know, to back to your, you know, menu of options, I think it's many different things, but this is where Canada, who has been a staunch supporter of COVAX and these kinds of global instruments, um, really needs to continue to step up and also put um, pressure on other countries to do the same, um, because this can't be about a vaccine power play. This really has to be about global solidarity. It needs to really be about, um, you know, improving access and distribution to vaccines um, all over the world. But because we know we're not out, we'll never get out of this pandemic and we will continue to have to deal with pandemics. This is not the last one. I know that's a depressing thought, but we will contend with this. So we better get these instruments right and they need to actually be governed by principles of solidarity, equity, and countries like Canada also have to do their part and, and step up. I could say more, but I think I'll, I'll quit while I'm ahead there. Thank you, Erika. Um, Hamir, you lived in Canada before. You've been working now for a long time with different international organizations. Um, in your opinion, what role Canadian multicultural society, and I know that you address part of this in your opening remarks, but what role Canadian multicultural society and various Canadian multicultural and ethnic NGOs and civil society organizations can play in helping Canada advance its humanitarian policy initiatives in the Middle East? You talked in your opening about how Canada sometimes is dragged into situations, for example, in the Middle East because of the connections with the diaspora communities. But now I want to sort of ask you more the other way around how these communities can be an asset for Canada to advance its humanitarian objectives uh, in the Middle East, in, in your uh, opinion. And, and Catherine, if you want to add to that after, please go ahead. But uh, Amir, go ahead first. A very interesting question. You know, it's, um, it's a catch-22 situation actually here because the government should be, be out, keep themselves this distance from the civil society and actually in NGOs, I mean, like Canadian government does it because you want to have the independence of the civil society and humanitarian actors, definitely, this is one of the main principles. But anyway, in reality, we see that the diaspora uh, who lives in Canada, um, from originated from the from Middle East or other parts of the world, would use their resources and their assets and their expertise and their human resources also and the connections back to home in order to play a, a positive role for the country of origin, basically. 
which that will happen anyway. And because it's happening anyway, and because actually we will have these connections, it's important for the Canada, for, for a government like Canada or any other kind of government who has that diaspora and has that connections to properly, properly use it, not misuse it, use it for the uh, advocacy of the of the values that uh, advocating the values that that country believes. I mean, Canada uh, claims to uh, have certain values. Like if you want to, uh, you know, express that and actually share that with other countries and other nations, should use this actually the, uh, in a good way. This um, possibility of actually having the diaspora or actually non-diaspora actually, but I mean, talking about Canadian NGOs, Canadian civil society, active in this region or other regions. It will give leverage anyway to Canada's foreign policy. If, if, if we like it or not, that will happen anyway. When you have Canadian organizations on the ground, civil society, private sector, international national organizations who are uh, originated from Canada, I mean, international NGOs, I mean here. It will give somehow a leverage and upper hand because of soft power matters, because of the track two level actual diplomacy to Canada in different countries. So it had to be actually utilized. It had to be managed, but not by government. And that's something that we had to be very careful actually, because this, uh, we have cases actually, some other governments try to use the, the civil society was originated from their own countries and created lots of problems later on actually, because it was seen as intervention through other means by certain governments in other countries actually but it's it's very important that, that this capacity to be uh, to be checked to be uh, to be supported to be actually promoted because anyway it's there but it's important actually that we keep the the humanitarian principles in mind but canada is not really that much using this uh humanitarian diplomacy or this capacity that it has really very much in the, in the Middle East. I mean, Canada tries to support the UN and a number of international NGOs who are really international, not Canadian, by giving them money or donation of goods and leave them on their own to uh, basically be operational in the area. It does not sometimes, or most of the times, really helps the Canada's foreign policy or humanitarian policy in the region, but you, you have different views about this. I mean, a lot of people believe that's the right way. You should keep that really separate. But as a government, if I was a politician in the Canadian government, I would try to definitely uh, see how that uh, aid that uh, taxpayers are providing through the government to these NGOs or uh, civil society or the UN in the region are helping me to have a higher leverage to promote the values that I believe. I'm talking positively here. You could use it differently also. If that was a answer to your question. Yeah, thank you, Amir. And last comments to you, Catherine, if you would like to uh, talk about this as well, especially uh, about the experience of Red Cross uh, in this area. I just appreciate if you, if you can make it brief in one minute because of the next session, we have to uh, wrap up this panel and make sure we can set up uh, the next discussion as well. Go ahead. Sure, I think uh, it kind of ties into comments Amir had mentioned earlier and what Eric had said. And um, so, uh, D, so taking it out of the political track, um, I think that the amazing multiculturalism of Canada lends itself to the fact that there are so many stories of people who have been impacted um, of, you know, of uh, humanitarian assistance, of conflict, of disaster, um, who live in Canada or whose family lives in Canada. And our positioning can be informed by that first person account uh, and the fact that we can hear a local story in Canada by the families, by the individuals who have been impacted. And that is an incredible, incredible both resource and responsibility, I would argue. Um, and and I, I take this on as a humanitarian myself that in order for me to be informed of the issues of which I you know, claim to be an expert, that I need to actually um, listen to and speak to and be informed by those who are most impacted by the situations that we're talking about. And the strength that Canada could have and could bolster itself with is by listening, um, accounting for, and really informing itself of those, of those stories, of those experiences, so that way we are coming from a position of 
um, information, of evidence, uh, and truly understanding the, the, the impact on humans, on the families, on the individuals and communities um, who we are purporting to assist and work with. And that's what I would say is the great uh, capability that we have in Canada. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. De Ruggiero, uh, Catherine Gribben, Amir Barmaki. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and thank you to all our attendees for participating in this panel discussion as well. Uh, the next uh, discussion, the next panel is going to start in only five minutes. It is a conversation with uh, David Petraeus. Uh, retired a U.S. Army general and former uh, director of CIA. Uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation, so please uh, join us in only four minutes. Thank you so much, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You Thank you very much. Bye-bye.